Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me and putting this uh, great symposium together. I want to thank the speakers yesterday. I actually learned a lot. I don't have many opportunities to, to hear about uh, terrestrial and freshwater systems, so um, I got a lot out of that. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, human-induced threats to pelagic mollusks, and I'll explain what pelagic means to those who are unfamiliar in just a moment. Uh, the main threats that I'll be talking about, although there are many, are climate-induced threats. So the uh, threats that you're probably all familiar with, there it goes. All right. Um, the threats uh, you're all familiar with, uh, when you think of climate change, mostly talking about global warming, increasing temperatures uh, throughout the planet, including in uh, surface waters of the oceans. Um, ocean acidification has become uh, part of the mainstream discussion as well. That's the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's what's causing the temperatures to rise, but it's also diffusing into the ocean where it uh, increases uh, the acidity, so the pH goes down. pH here decreasing in surface waters. Um, and as it becomes more acidic, it uh, can dissolve uh, structures made of calcium carbonate. So obviously the mollusk shells that uh, we're all interested in here, as well as uh, corals and um, sea urchins and other uh, calcifying organisms. Less familiar to most people so far is that the oceans are becoming um, less oxygenated as well. The oxygen content of the oceans is declining. And it's unclear. There are natural trends in this as well. Um, and we're still sorting those out. Um, but uh, there are strong reasons to believe that oxygen should decline because warmer water holds less dissolved gas. So oxygen content in surface waters is decreasing. And it also causes stratification. That is, surface waters become warm and they float on top of deeper water. And so you don't get as much mixing of those layers as you might otherwise, so atmospheric oxygen is not brought down into the ocean. So there's deoxygenation, and I'll talk about oxygen minimum zones in a little bit. These are natural, expansive layers of low oxygen um, at intermediate depths throughout the ocean, and those are expanding. So the oxygen content is decreasing, and the width or the, the depth of those oxygen minimum zones is um, becoming shallower and deeper on, on both ends. So the uh, opinions on climate change and its effects vary from uh, this by Thomas Lovejoy, the consequences for ocean life are shaking the biological underpinnings of civilization. I'm not even sure what that means, really. Um, <laughs> but it sounds scary. So um, <laughs> at the other end of the spectrum, you've got uh, senators that uh, don't believe climate change is real. And amazing quotes like this one, since we emit CO2 every day from respiration, it's clearly not harmful, but what he's missing is there's a reason we're emitting it rather than holding it in, because it's toxic and it will kill you. Um, so, um, so what we need is to understand how organisms respond to CO2, to oxygen, to temperature changes, and that involves physiology. So I'm primarily an animal physiologist, and I will talk about some physiology in here if uh, it's hard to provide background for it, so if you're, um, you stop me at any time and ask me to explain or just take a short nap, that's fine too. But we're, um, uh, we're talking about mechanisms, how animals take CO2 uh, from the water into their bodies, how they um, are able to buffer that, how they um, control the pH, um, how they get enough oxygen from outside to, to their cells where it's used in respiration. So, you need a physiological mechanistic understanding to understand and predict what organisms are going to do in the future with these changes. But you can easily get lost in this level of detail, and this is actually not as detailed as some of these types of diagrams can get. It can be very complicated. And when you get lost in that mechanism, you end up with uh, beautiful quotes like this one from a book chapter that I'm actually sadly an author on. I missed this in the editorial process somehow or wasn't paying attention. But this is probably the most 
useless sentence ever printed, I think. Depending on environmental scenarios, energy turnover, mode of life, specific physiological capacities for resistance, acclimatization, and adaptation, a diversity of responses appear conceivable. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what we want to avoid, is just mush, basically. Um, that's not helpful. So we're trying to come up with ways to predict how animals are going to change. And it becomes more complicated when you think about multiple stressors. So you can have uh, the carbon dioxide and oxygen um, pathways interacting and they're temperature specific because metabolism goes faster when you're warmer. Um, and then you've got feeding responses and changes in the food availability with climate, all these things interacting together. Um, so while ocean acidification and I'd say global warming as well have received widespread recognition, the consequences of all these variables working synergistically um, together have not really been considered very strongly yet. That, that process is uh, continuing. People are starting to think about these things in conjunction more. But it's something we're struggling with and working toward. So I study oxygen minimum zones, uh, animals out in the open ocean that live in these natural um, low oxygen zones. So this on the left is a profile, a depth profile. So as you go deeper in the ocean to 1,500 meters here, uh, so roughly a mile down. Oxygen declines very rapidly in some areas. This is the eastern tropical Pacific. So this purplish region here, as you go deeper, oxygen drops very fast and stays very, very low. So this is uh, a few micromoles. Air saturated water is about 200 to 300 micromoles depending on temperature. And this is two to five maybe micromoles in the eastern tropical Pacific. So very little oxygen available through much of the deep ocean in the in the tropics here. In the California current, this blue line, oxygen is a little bit higher, it drops more slowly. So animals in surface waters tend to be just fine, but as you go a little, whoops, back up here. All right, let's go a little deeper. Um, it does drop fairly low. Uh, this is the Red Sea, and this is uh, polar waters in the, in the Antarctic, um, because uh, water becomes very cold and Sailing there, it sinks and it takes that oxygen deeper with it. So you've got uh, better mixing here and um, oxygen throughout the entire depth range. So highly variable oxygen profiles around the world, um, but there are these expansive oxygen minimum zones you see here. So this is the amount of oxygen um, at, I believe, 300 meters depth, showing that all these purple regions are micromoles, a few micromoles, uh, the tropics up here. Oh, so this is in partial pressure, it looks like. So 20 is air saturated. Sorry if I jump units, if anybody cares about units. Um, and because this is primarily caused by animals consuming oxygen, they're also producing carbon dioxide, there's a strong relationship between the amount of oxygen in the water and the amount of carbon dioxide in the water. And so a, a correlation as well with the, the pH, the acidity. So all these things are changing in concert. And as you go deeper, in the eastern tropical Pacific, temperature drops very fast also, whereas in the Red Sea, temperature is constant at about 20 degrees Celsius um, throughout the depth range. So there's a lot of variation in how these things interact together, and we can compare different regions to sort out how these variables influence animals. So why pelagic? Why open ocean? Very few people ever get a chance to see the animals that I study. Um, that's because people live here on these black parts, the land, and we can study within a few miles of the coast of that. So this is an equal area projection. If you think of surface area of the planet, this is what it looks like. This is what everybody's used to thinking about. But if you were to think of the volume of living space, the, the amount of space you could actually occupy, it would look more like this. So the open ocean is huge. It's very deep. There's a lot of space and a lot of animals living out there. And there's a handful of us studying them compared to thousands of people studying coastal species. So trying to chip in there where I can. All right, so this is a paper that came out last year that um, is attempting to get at the interaction between temperature, oxygen, and CO2, and how that influences animal distributions. So basically it's a, an equation that we 
called the metabolic index, and it's just a ratio of oxygen supply to oxygen demand. So the oxygen supply is how much oxygen is in the water. Oxygen demand is how fast an animal is consuming oxygen. And that depends on body mass, temperature, and this, this figure, which is uh, the ability of animals to extract oxygen from the water, how big their gills are, um, how, how their blood binds onto oxygen, things like that. So what it predicts is through most of the ocean, as you go deeper, you actually gain a metabolic advantage because the temperature drops, and so your oxygen demand drops faster than oxygen supply. But in these really strong oxygen minimum zones, the amount of oxygen drops faster than oxygen supply. So it's actually uh, harder to live at depth in these regions than at the surface. Right. So, let me back up for a second. So when we can calculate without having to measure the gills and the blood and all of these different things, we can figure out what this term is because there's one measurement called the critical oxygen partial pressure at which point oxygen supply exactly equals oxygen demand. So this becomes one, and you can solve for that. So that's what we've done for a number of organisms, and we're funded right now to go out and measure this critical oxygen partial pressure in every species we can get our hands on, basically. So what it is... So if you have this metabolic index for a species, um, you can compare that to where animals are living. That's a very good point. Um, so, you know what, if you know the species distribution, you can calculate their metabolic index throughout that range. And what we've found is, at the southernmost distribution, most animals tend to have a metabolic index of two, which means that it seems like in order to have a thriving population, you need at least twice as much oxygen as... Um, as you would demand at your resting lowest level. So there has to be at least twice that much oxygen to permit you to chase prey, to avoid predators, to reproduce, and all these things. So, so for any individual species, you can create a map that shows what that metabolic index is throughout their range, and all of them seem to have a pretty common lower limit. So at a metabolic index of about two, that, that tells you the lower, the southernmost limit for a lot of different species and then we can predict how that's going to change with climate. So we can tell where that population is going to move based on that. Um, a lower metabolic index or a, the southernmost range, that's where the temperature is highest, their metabolic demand is higher, so it's going to be their lowest metabolic index. As you go north, there's more oxygen available and lower temperatures, and the metabolic index increases. Yes? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> yes, good point. So toward the, toward the poles, or sorry, toward the poles you have higher metabolic index, toward the equator a lower metabolic index. And that sets the species northern or southern distribution depending on the equator word distribution. Thank you. All right, so that'll be come more or less clear. I'm not sure which as we move along. But <laughs> so this critical oxygen partial pressure is a measurement that integrates all of these physiological variables. So if you put an animal in a chamber and you have an oxygen probe in it and you seal it up and you let the animal consume oxygen, it'll maintain a constant rate of oxygen consumption as oxygen drops. So oxygen is decreasing toward the left their oxygen consumption rate is staying constant down to some critically low level. At that point, their blood can't bind enough oxygen, their gills are insufficient, their heart can't go fast enough. And so that's the measurement we're trying to make. Through this part, the heart rate is increasing, the blood is changing its chemistry to bind oxygen better, and all these things, it's adjusting for this lower oxygen, but once it gets to this point, can no longer adjust. So we're trying to measure this critical point for as many species as we can and relate that to temperature and carbon dioxide as well. So with warming and for some species acidification, 
that critical oxygen level is going to be higher. It's going to require more oxygen to sustain this rate. And as oxygen declines, obviously, they're going to be pushed beyond that critical limit. So don't get too bogged down in this if it's not quite clear. It's just I'm going to switch to an uh, easier mode here for a moment and talk about the animals, and we'll come back to the physiology here toward the end. So I've worked on a number of different species. I have done a lot of work with pteropods, which I suspect uh, you've all at least heard of. There are three uh, pteropod specimens out here in the hallway. If you haven't seen those yet, you should take a look. They're very small. They are gastropods um, that some groups, the thecosomes, have a shell. They can be coiled or long and pointy. Some of them are pseudothecosomes. They have a, a shell, but it's gelatinous. It's not heavily calcified. Some of them have this helical coil. Then there are the gymnosomes, which are naked. As adults, they lack a shell entirely. They do have a shell um, in the larval stage, but they lose it as an adult. Things flashing. Um, so they can take a lot of different forms. They're commonly called sea angels. The thecosomes are commonly called sea butterflies. And the foot in these has evolved into paired wings. So they fly around in the water. Um, and there are about 30 to 40 species described. Um, there are currently no taxonomists working on them. Um, so <laughs> I don't think. Um, and they've become sort of the poster child. We are talking uh, yesterday about perception and how we change public perception. Well, I would say with pteropods, we have very successfully changed public perception from absolutely no idea what those are, why would anyone care, to, oh my gosh, pteropods are gone. The whole world is going to fall apart. It's really been pretty, pretty stunning. When I started working on pteropods, I was interested in how they adapt to cold temperatures in the Antarctic. And uh, we had reviewers of our proposals say, these groups are unimportant. Why would anyone care? You're never even going to find them. They're, they're too patchy in their distribution. They're too small to do physiology on. Why bother? And I don't know exactly how it changed, but it did. And now, basically, you, uh, they are responsible for the livelihoods of all fish and whales on the planet. So this gives you some idea how they fly. these. This is uh, Limacina helicina. It's very abundant in polar environments. And it's abundant throughout temperate waters as well, if you know where to look for them. But they ac accumulate near shore in the Antarctic. And so we can collect them very easily there. They remind me, um, for those of you probably were mostly old enough to remember uh, the flying toaster screensavers. Um, <laughs> that's what they look like to me. And then. Uh, these are, oops, do I keep hitting something? Is that what's happening? Maybe we just go to sleep. All right. So this is what a sea angel does all day. I don't think I'm hitting anything here. There we go. So they fly through the water like that. Uh, so this is uh, work that I did in the Antarctic showing, um, this was project that got me interested in them, and um, I'll just briefly mention it. We were interested in how they continue to flap those wings at minus two degrees Celsius in the Antarctic. It requires a lot of energy, and these are mitochondria in the wing muscles. The mitochondria is where you produce ATP, the chemical energy that, that fuels all of our activities. And so in their muscles in the wings, They've got red muscle, just like we do, that has a lot of mitochondria. And then you have the equivalent of white muscle that doesn't have mitochondria. So in the, the northern hemisphere species that lives in temperate, slightly warmer waters, if you touch them on the tail, they've got a burst swimming ability. They can take off and swim faster to avoid predators. The Antarctic one, if you touch it on the tail, it just curls up into a little ball. It doesn't do anything. And the reason is because in order to swim at minus 2 degrees, they've had to have They've had to increase the amount of mitochondria and 
the mitochondria themselves are better. Or, so all these little, all the surface area of, uh, it's called Christi, inside the mitochondria gives them more ability to produce energy. So in the Antarctic, they don't have that white muscle. It's all red muscle. So they can't burst swim away. And if you compare the amount of mitochondria they have to a hummingbird or a tuna fish, it's pretty equivalent. They're, they are high performance slugs. Um, so, so that was a fun little project that got us interested. It had nothing to do with climate change at the time, but we had to struggle to convince people that they were important enough to work on and, and that we could do this. Shortly after that, ocean acidification started to become a thing. It uh, started with corals. People were starting to talk about it around 99, 2000 in corals, maybe a little earlier than that. Um, we put out a review paper, uh, Vicki Fabry and myself, in 2003 that suggested pteropods would be sensitive because they have shells made of aragonite and they're very thin and they don't have any protective coatings. And so we were concerned about them. And we published some uh, observations that Vicki had done much earlier where she put animals in a chamber and was trying to measure their growth rates, but their own carbon dioxide production caused the pH to drop and their shells started to dissolve rather than grow. So she had this sort of unpublished data that we referred to in this paper and it was um, published as well in these two papers in Science and Nature and that put pteropods literally on the cover of Science and on the map. Um, these two papers have been cited thousands of times, but that was all the data there was at that time, was those observations from a decade earlier. Those papers don't refer to the carbonate chemistry that they put them in because it wasn't measured. They don't have sample sizes or statistics. So there was really nothing supporting that it was speculation. It turns out from work by Nina Bednersek and a number of others that um, it seems like there is reason to have concern, but this is what put pteropods on the map. And so shortly after that, this story came out in a newspaper that I thought was hilarious. Um, said, unlike global warming, ocean acidification is a very straightforward, simple story. Man makes CO2, CO2 goes into water, little snails go bye-bye, fishes and whales starve to death. So um, it is not nearly that simple, um, but they are important in a lot of... Uh, environments, and at least during certain times, they are important in the diets of salmon and birds and whales and others. But my suspicion is if the little snails go bye-bye, the fishes and whales will eat something else. But they are occasionally very important in their diets. In fact, the um, Limacina will accumulate uh, sulfide in its gut and become black, and fish that eat that, their tissues turn black and they're no longer marketable. So they have had that effect on cod fishing in the, in the Northeast. Um, just a note on how we collect these. This is a trawl net that was designed to catch deep sea animals in very good condition. Because the net is so long, the pressure of water leaving the net is relatively low. And so we can get animals back into the cod end, clear back here, um, without having them plastered against the net and torn up to some extent. However, they still come up like this in the cod end. There's fish and crustaceans and jellyfish with all their stinging tentacles, siphonophores, all mushed together in a bucket, and any pteropods in here are almost surely damaged. You do occasionally get a few out that are in great shape, but nets are not a great way to collect pteropods. Uh, we showed in the Antarctic, if you catch pteropods with this little net through a hole in the ice, they have lower metabolism, lower survivability than if we collect them by hand using these sophisticated uh, jelly dippers, we call them. Uh, it's a beaker attached to the end of a broom handle. You can <laughs> dip them out of the water there. So this is McMurdo Station, Antarctica. Um, so we helicopter around to collect pteropods, which I also think is hilarious, but um, <laughs> to, to solve global warming. This is a, it's, yeah, anyway. So how we collect them now is uh, blue water diving. So we go out into the open ocean. The bottom depth is thousands of meters below. So we're all tethered so you don't drift deeper or off out into the open ocean. And we have these jars. 
And you have to kind of focus on your hand and then take your hand away and you'll see all the animals sort of pop out at you. So this is a pseudothecosome pteropod that she's collecting there. So we can collect them very gently without damaging them. And even so, it's still tough to get them back into the lab and transfer them into a chamber without damaging the shells in some cases. Uh, and I mentioned some of these animals are vertical migrators. So obviously we're diving in the upper 30 meters or so. Um, a lot of animals migrate to deeper water during the daytime. So there's relatively little. At night, it can be zooplankton soup, especially in these areas with really strong oxygen minimum zones because the animals all migrate up to where there's enough oxygen uh, at night. And so the diving can be pretty spectacular at night. We've got these cool little James Bond flashlights taped to our wrist, which is fun. So we can keep our hands free for the jars. All right, so um, talk a little bit about the research we did on pteropods in high CO2 in the Antarctic. And then I'll move on to squids, which I have not talked about yet, but I've been working on more recently. So this is just to show that pH varies naturally in the Antarctic and elsewhere due to phytoplankton blooms. When the phytoplankton come out, they suck up CO2 from the water and the pH goes down. So this is pH of about 8. And when they are gone in the austral winter months, then the CO2 is lower. Sorry, I got that backwards. But anyway, the pH varies due to the phytoplankton blooms up to about 8.4. So we studied metabolic rates. Um, we also measured calcification um, and showed that the metabolic rate of these animals is affected by high CO2. It suppresses their metabolic rate. So they go into sort of a, um, a torpor, which I think they do naturally when they overwinter, um, CO2 triggers them to drop into this hibernative state. So their metabolism is maybe 20% lower at high CO2 than it is at low CO2. What's interesting, though, is that starvation causes the same effect. So these are animals we held in the lab without food at all of those CO2 concentrations. And its metabolism is already suppressed, and CO2 doesn't do anything additionally to them. So when we went back, so this was in 2007, we did this experiment. And we went back in 2008 and found that no matter what we did to them, they had low metabolic rates. And the reason is there's natural variation in the amount of food available. So depending on how much ice cover there is, you'll either get large or small phytoplankton blooms, more or less food available for these animals. And the metabolic rate that we measured in these years varies with that. So the effect of CO2 on these animals is going to vary depending on years. So the case to be made here is long-term studies, firstly, and that it's complicated. And don't publish immediately your first results, because we did include this data in, the, in a review paper in 2007, and then went back in 2008 and found nothing. And we're very confused by that for a while. So lesson learned. So seasonal variation um, and yearly variation in the effect of CO2 on these animals, depending on how much food is available. Everybody following that? Questions so far? All right. Another th thing to point out, um, I mentioned there are temperate uh, northern hemisphere populations and there are southern hemisphere populations. They were considered to be the same species, Limacina helicina, in both the North and Southern Hemisphere. It was considered a bipolar species. In other words, morphologically, nobody could tell the difference between them. But genetically, there's a 33% divergence in the sequence of the cytochrome C oxidase gene, which, uh, depending on, it's hard to say exactly what that means, but it means that they are not the same species. They are very different. If these were fish, they'd be in different orders, not the same species. So um, we don't know a lot about what species are in pteropods. We don't know um, what the differences in one species compared to another, what the difference in how they react to CO2 is. And so we need to be cautious. 
Uh, these are some of the vertically migrating species we've looked at. These are day and night distributions for five different species. Some of them stay permanently shallow. Some of them um, occupy the entire depth range. Some are shallower at night and deeper in the daytime. In the case here, what we found is that the only species that was affected by CO2 is the one that never dives down into the oxygen minimum zone. It stays in shallow water where CO2 is always low, and it was unaffected by any CO2, or sorry, it was the only one affected by CO2. The rest of them that um, occasionally experience natural CO2 showed no effect in the laboratory in terms of metabolic rate. It doesn't mean calcification wouldn't be affected or that maybe their shells dissolve when they're deep in the daytime and they rebuild them at night, shallow. Still a lot to figure out. All right. So just a, a note on a few other strange pelagic mollusks that some of you may be familiar with. These are heteropods, commonly called sea elephants. Um, they have this long snout, thus the name elephant. So you can see it here. The radula is at the end of the snout and little jaws to, to grab things. They're voracious predators. To my knowledge, they're exclusively shallow living, but again, not very much is known about these either. They have very large tubular eyes, very good hunters. Some of them have very prominent shells. These tend to be fairly small. Um, some of them, the shell is very reduced. Some of them have lost the shell entirely. This one in the jar here um, has no shell. So those are out there. Uh, this is one on a blue water dive. So that's what they, they can be up to about uh, 20 or 30 centimeters long. So they do get fairly large, but most of them are smaller. There are strange animals called filaroe. And all of these have um, calcified shells as larvae. So, but these are naked as adults. So digestive systems going on in here. These are bioluminescent, and they're laterally compressed, so they are shaped more or less like a fish, and they swim like a fish, as we'll see in a minute. So there's one swimming. So these are pelagic nudibranchs. And then there's these guys, which are um, commonly called uh, raft, rafting snails. They produce a raft made of bubbles. This is just a short little video. But, um, they produce a raft of bubbles and float upside down on the surface of the ocean. So those are fully shelled and calcified. So a lot of strange mollusks out there. And of course, there are the cephalopods, which are my personal favorites and the ones I've spent most of my time working on. Uh, most of them are not calcified and so are not expected to be um, damaged much by ocean acidification. But some of the faster living ones, um, as I'll explain, uh, have blood that's very sensitive to pH and it's going to cause problems for them, I believe. So these are Argonauts, paper nautilus. They have a thinly calcified egg case slash shell. Uh, the vampire squid, this is Histiotuthis, which has one large eye and one small eye, commonly called the cockeyed squid. Um, then, of course, Architeuthis. This is the only video of a live Architeuthis giant squid ever. So a lot of really neat uh, cephalopod diversity out in the open ocean. And these are Decidicus gigas, the jumbo squid. They do get very large. This video is showing smaller ones. So this is blue water diving at night, um, specifically to catch these, or to observe these squid. And this one ran right into me and was momentarily stunned. So um, it actually hurt. <laughs> it was going very fast. So then it was kind of knocked itself silly for a bit and then took off again. So there's one of the largest fisheries is for Decidicus. Um, they're heavily fished throughout Mexico and, and South America. And yet, we know almost nothing about them, except that they get large. This is Al Nayak, a former student of mine who is six foot five. I won't tell you his weight, um, <laughs> but he's, he's big. So the squid do get very big. This is the first and until recently only observation of an egg mass from Decidicus. Even though there's a fishery for them, Nobody knows anything about the reproduction. So this egg mass, as you'll see in a minute, is about the size of this room. Um, there's a diver inside it. Um, so as far as we know, this was laid by a single female. Uh, 
millions of eggs in it. The eggs are a few, just a few millimeters long, or actually about, a, yeah, about 0.7 millimeters long, very tiny. Um, so this was laid, obviously, by a very large individual. Uh, the population, though, responds to temperature. It's shown recently that depending on the temperature they experience when they're young, they either grow for two years and reach reproductive maturity at a very large size, or they grow one year and reach reproductive maturity at a small size. So these are obviously the large size. Um, more recently, we were out there and only found the small size, and they lay proportionally smaller egg masses. So roughly a meter to a meter and a half across. There's one here. So they're difficult to see. So it's just collecting some of the eggs. All right, so am I doing on time? Five minutes. All right, so Decidicus lives in the eastern tropical Pacific, and its distribution mirrors almost exactly the oxygen minimum zone, which is unusual because Decidicus is an extremely fast animal. They belong to the family Omastrephidae. These are metabolic rates over a size range. Uh, for comparison, these are jellyfish and vampire squids down here. And this is a log scale. So this is a metabolic rate of 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and so on. And so um, these guys have a metabolic rate, an oxygen consumption rate, more than 100 times faster than the vampire squid. And depending on size, quite a bit faster than even mammals, faster than we consume oxygen. Very fast animals, uh, very oxygen demanding, and yet they live in an environment that has very little oxygen. So we were interested in that. And some have speculated that their distribution is shifting as the oxygen declines. And I don't believe this. I think it's a coincidence. But uh, off California current, squid abundance increased in the last decade or so. Um, as oxygen declined, but oxygen is still declining and the squids have since disappeared for the most part. And there are records of them being found off California in the 1930s, so it's, um, it's a short memory, I think, is what's causing this phenomenon. Um, but their blood, because they consume so much oxygen, their blood is very pH sensitive. And I'll explain this. It's not critical that um, we fully nail that down just now, but um, so you consume oxygen at the gills, it's transported to your tissues, and the carbon dioxide that your muscles and other tissues produce helps cause the blood to release more oxygen at that site. So the more pH sensitive you are, the more you can extract oxygen out of your own blood. And squid blood is blue, I don't know if you know this. When it's not bound to oxygen, it's completely transparent. When it is bound to oxygen, it's very dark blue. And so this changes with the pH, and you can use that to put it in a spectrophotometer and measure the color, the absorbance, and determine how well it binds oxygen. So it binds oxygen in a very temperature and pH sensitive way, which leads us to predict that they will um, be harmed by ocean acidification, especially at high temperatures and when they're most active. So we can put them in chambers like this. This is a called a swim tunnel. It's basically a treadmill for squids. Um, ah, every time I do that. There it is. So you can create a current of water that they have to swim against, and then you can measure how much oxygen they're consuming while they do that. So. <laughs> All right. so we're measuring this critical oxygen level, just to remind you. Um, and this is, it's not quite a constant rate of oxygen consumption, but at 20 degrees, it's higher, and the critical oxygen level is reached at a higher oxygen partial pressure than it is at 10 degrees. So they tolerate low oxygen better at colder temperatures. And this is Decidicus compared to a coastal species, uh, used to be Lalago, now it's Dorytuthus. So they are, because they live in a low oxygen environment, they are adapted for it, and they can extract oxygen better and survive better in low oxygen than other species can, even though they've got the same rate of oxygen consumption. All right. So what we can do with this, we were talking about the maps earlier. You can um, predict their geographic distribution, and you can also predict their depth distribution. 
So because it's temperature sensitive, that critical oxygen level declines as you go deeper and the temperature drops. Oxygen is also dropping. So this is where those two intersect in the Gulf of California is as deep as they can go and still support metabolism with oxygen. So in the Gulf of California, Baja and Eastern Tropical Pacific, they are limited to the upper 200 meters of the water. In the California current, where the temperature is a lot lower, the critical oxygen level is lower, and the oxygen itself is higher, so they can occupy the upper 500 meters of the water. And that's exactly what they do. So these are depth distributions of those squid taken from uh, the submersibles in the Monterey Aquarium Research Institute, showing that their depth distribution matches pretty closely that physiological prediction. They do, they're actually able to go deeper, but they have to shut metabolism down. These are things that mollusks are very good at. They can, like uh, bivalves intertidally, can shut metabolism down until the tide comes back up. So for weeks they can do that. And we've shown more recently that that critical oxygen level is in fact affected by pH. And so we can start to incorporate that bit of information as well um, and map where these squids will go with climate change. So the lower the pH, the higher the critical oxygen level. In other words, they're less tolerant of low oxygen when the CO2 is high and the pH is low. And when you put them in these chambers and measure oxygen consumption, the blue is normal CO2, and then we changed the CO2 on them, and they were immediately knocked down. So they cannot maintain a high rate of oxygen consumption when there's high CO2 in the water. So this is sort of a prediction for this uh, expanded oxygen minimum zone. Just to summarize here, you've got this layer of lowest oxygen, um, and that's expanding. So a much thicker oxygen minimum zone. Um, you're going to have warming and acidification in shallow water, and that's going to compress the habitat available to these animals that vertically migrate. They'll have to come up shallower at night, and it's going to compress Predators like Dasyticus and marlin and tuna that demand a lot of oxygen, it's going to compress them into shallower water where they're going to be more, more vulnerable to their own predators or fishermen. So that's the concern is this habitat compression. And additionally, we'll be able to show that their geographic distributions will shift northward or southward, depending on your hemisphere. Um, as um, oxygen changes. Currently, they're still able to occupy the oxygen minimum zone in the eastern tropical Pacific, but it is getting warmer and more acidic and lower in oxygen, and they are presumably being forced into shallower water already and will eventually be forced northward. They are very plastic and very adaptable, so um, they may deal with it, but it's going to change the ecosystems that they leave behind and the ecosystems that they move into. So, are mollusks in peril? Um, some mollusks, I believe, are imperiled. I think the pteropods, due to their calcification issues, um, are going to suffer some consequences from that. Um, certainly under some conditions, uh, the squids are going to be imperiled by that. Some mollusks are likely not imperiled under any conditions, and I acknowledge that this conclusion is about as useless as that slide I put up earlier. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> it's about the best we can do right now. But we are working on ways to make better predictions for individual species. Um, and I think most importantly, most mollusks have never been studied and may or may not be imperiled. So um, Julia sent this to me yesterday. She's talking next, and she was kind enough to let me take this joke. But uh, she remembered that the March of the Penguins uh, rating was G-rated, but... Um, it said, contains mild peril, and I think that's the, the take-home <laughs> message. Um, so I think mollusks um, contain some mild peril. We should definitely be concerned, but uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>